Good evening, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study as we're going through the book of James. We have uh, lesson 18 this evening, one more lesson left, and then we're going to start a basic uh, course, which I had the booklets uh, somewhere around here, somebody took them on me, but uh, I wanted to show you a series that we're going to be starting after we finish the book of James, and uh, we're going to start a basic series on basic doctrines, and I'm going to use this this uh, curriculum called Foundations of My Faith. I'm not going to follow with with it completely, but there's about 20, uh, 20 books here, so you guys can see it if you want to order it. So some of them, some of these books are really short. We may cover a couple per lesson, uh, but uh, it's good good material on basic doctrines, understanding salvation, uh, eternal security, uh, the Word of God. Uh, we're going to go through these. Grace, it talks about grace. Then we talk about Jesus Christ. Uh, pretty good material for a basic understanding of, of basic and foundational Christian doctrines. So join us as we will start this series in about two weeks because we have one more lesson in the book of James and we'll get into that. So I really want to finish this evening's lesson. We have a lot of material to cover. <clears throat> uh, some of it a little controversial, but uh, bear with us as we show you what the Word of God says. You may, you may have been exposed to these uh, so-called faith healers on television. They have these crusades and they tell you, put your hands on the TV and you'll be healed. Uh, send me money and your cancer will be cured. Uh, pray uh, this prayer of healing and you'll be healed. Um, and, and that's called the charismatic movement. Now, I believe that's one of the movements that defined or defines the apostasy of the modern church. Another is the Adoption of the corrupt Greek text. Uh, <clears throat> if somebody can get me those books up there in the corner, my daughter knows exactly what I'm talking about. She was helping me, helping me find them. Uh, that's a, I believe, when the modern modern Christian scholarship adopted the corrupt Greek text, which is Nestle Allen's Greek text, over the Texas Receptus, which is the Byzantine type text, which comes from Antioch, which comes from the Byzantine Empire, it comes from the Greek scholars, and if you ever wondered uh, how the Reformation started in Europe, it's when the Ottoman Turks invaded the Byzantine Empire, and all the Greek scholars left the Byzantine Empire and went to uh, Western Europe, and they brought the Greek manuscripts with them, and guess what happened when they found the true manuscripts, and they started translating the Bibles from the true manuscripts, revival broke out in Europe, and uh, we call this the Texas Receptus, this one over here, and it comes from the Byzantine type text manuscript. And so when the corrupt Greek text produced by Nestle and Hort, uh, Wes Gunhort, uh, this is the 28th edition of the uh, Nestle Allen's Greek New Text, that defined another uh, peg in the apostasy of the modern church. Another one is happening recently, the last uh, 20 or so years, is the adoption of secular music into worship services of most Christian churches. In fact, we were having a discussion today, earlier today, uh, Christian rock music, that's an oxymoron, as, 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 uh, as perfect as you can get, a Christian rock music, we're an oxymoron. Now look up what the definition of rock and roll is, what it means, stands for, and, you can, and then tell me if Christian and rock and roll belong together. Uh, and then we have... Uh, a lot of things entering into the into the uh, modern church today. The charismatic movement is one of them. Uh, they believe that they are led by the Holy Spirit, but uh, I'm here to tell you, and I may offend you a little bit, but they're not led by the Holy Spirit. They're led by Satan himself. In 2 Corinthians 11, 14, Paul writes, and even back in his day, uh, he was warning the Christians. He says, and no marvel, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That means that uh, the devil is very deceptive and whatever you hear must match with the Word of God. If it doesn't match the Word of God, then you reject it. This is your standard. If it's not in this book, then you reject it. Uh, Christ, one of the things that Christ rebuked the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers and the scribes of his day was that they were teaching the commandments of men as doctrines of God. You have to be careful of that. Uh, 
God is not the author of confusion, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Why does he say that to Corinthian churches? Because they were a carnal church and there was a lot of turmoil in the church, a lot of division, a lot of arguing uh, who's right and who's wrong. We see that in today's day and age. Uh, one of the things I, I mentioned, and I do not harp on it too much, is the use of the King James Bible. Uh, and I don't talk too much about it, but every once in a while I mention it when, when, when needed, because I believe it's the only English Bible that's doctrinally inerrant. And I'll give you just one example. Um, in Romans, where am I going with all this? We start talking about the doctrine of healing, because James soon is going to tell us how people ought to be healed in the church. And it contradicts the methods that many are spouting today, which are contradictory to Scripture. But I want to give you an example of why I push. I don't push, but I uphold the King James Bible as a Bible that's doctrinally inerrant. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, our Bible says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church with, which is at Sancria. Now, Phoebe was a, cert, uh, a prominent figure in the Christian church. She was uh, prominent because she was a helper. And Paul said to the Romans, when she comes, uh, I'm sending her. So whatever she tells you, you guys better listen to her. He was not giving her some authority that, that uh, was unscriptural, but she was a, as a worker for Christ, and she was noted for that. But in the NIV, Romans 16.1 says this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sancria. That's what the NIV says. The RSV says the following, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deaconess of the church at Sancria. So now we know through the study of the scripture that God has given two offices to the church, the office of a pastor or minister and the office of a deacon. And these positions are reserved for men who are qualified. But if you have an NIV or RSV, then you would think it's okay to have a female deaconess or a female deacon. Well, Phoebe, you say, was one, and you point to these verses. So if you've got the wrong Bible, you're going to get wrong doctrine. I don't know how else to say it. Now, I want to go back on the charismatic movement. And these are people who accept a range of supernatural experiences. I'm going to give you a few of them. They still believe in prophecy. They believe in miracles and healing and physical manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, we have to be careful because the early church did have these physical manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but they're not the same as they are today. Uh, they, for example, you may have heard of holy laughter. Uh, they shake uncontrollably. They roll around on the floor barking like a dog. I've seen it. I've heard it. Uh, they speak in tongues. You heard of speaking in tongues? They have visions. Oh, I received a word from the Lord. Uh, they're in church and they say, have you gotten a rhema from the Lord? And the person comes up and he starts spouting garbage. Uh, they, were, they talk about being slain in the spirit. You see uh, Benny Hinn and he knocks people in the head and they fall over. The power of suggestion is very powerful. And then they lay on hands. I would not want anyone to lay hands on me because that's how spirits are transferred. Yes. If someone has demons and he lays hands on you, guess what? You're going to get their demon. And the most egregious one is the... Uh, have you been baptized by the Holy Ghost? What they're talking about is, have you been baptized by fire? Now, I don't want to get baptized by fire. Because Christ is going to either baptize you with the Holy Ghost, or He's going to baptize you with fire. Not with both. The first one is the new birth, and the second one is hell, the second death. So, I don't want to be baptized with fire. You can pray to God all you want, all day long, get blue in the face, Oh Lord, please baptize me with fire. You have no idea what you're praying. You're not praying with understanding. The moment you receive Christ as Savior, you're automatically baptized by the Holy Spirit. You don't need a second blessing. Now, yes, as you pray, you may have the Holy Spirit come upon you mightily in some different ways and encourage you and, and show you the presence of God as you're reading your Bible, you're praying. Yes, that, that does happen. But that's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So, all these manifestations that we hear from the charismatic movement, including the faith healing movement happened from an altered state of consciousness, the mind is very powerful, or demonic man manifestations. And both of these are not by the Spirit. And the Bible tells us the sign gifts would come to an end. Paul, as he's exhorting the Corinthians to seek the better gifts, he tells them that these sign gifts will come to an end. 
1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we now, we know in part, but we, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, which I believe is the scriptures, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Remember, back in the early church, they didn't have the, 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 the completed Bible. Yes, they had the Old Testament, and we believe the Old Testament is part of our Bible. Uh, I believe uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, uh, Job, Psalms, the prophets, the Old Testament, Jewish prophets, are as much as inspired as the New Testament books, the Gospels, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all the Pauline epistles, and so forth and so on. But we are told that when that which is perfect, which I believe is a completed canon of Scripture, appears, then all these gifts will be done away with. Now, why were these gifts given to the early church? They were given to convince the Jewish people that the Holy Spirit was indeed from God. The Bible says that Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Uh, the Jews believed that salvation was only for them. So how could God convince the Jewish people that yes, now salvation can be given to the Gentiles, the Goyim? The heathen, signs. God showed signs among the Gentile believers in the early church to convince the Jews that yes, salvation is not only for them, but also for the Gentiles. John Chrysostom, who uh, was born in the 3rd century AD, affirms that even in his day, the sign gifts of the Spirit had ceased. So today when you hear these uh, so-called faith healers and charlatans is what I call them, uh, they claim to be apostles, uh, faith healers, uh, they're proponents of the prosperity gospel, teaching that God rewards active faith with health and wealth. Come to God, He's going to heal all your sicknesses and give you all the money in the world. Because they know if they teach that, you're going to flock to them. Because what is everybody concerned about today? They're concerned about their health and their wealth. Uh, people today are worried about getting COVID versus going to hell. No, I'm not making light of the disease. I, in fact, my, da my friend's dad, recently I found out that his dad in the 70s died from COVID, and I'm not happy about that. But why are you worried about more f over COVID than your eternal soul? Yeah. Why is that? You're worried about your wealth, you're worried about your health, but how about your eternal soul? Why aren't you worried about what, hap what will happen to you after you die? Why don't these faith healers go around healing all the people in the hospital? We have doctor friends here. We have doctors that we know. They'll invite them. Hey, you faith healer, come over here. Uh, I'll bring you to the hospital ward and I'll show you all these sick people. You got the gift of healing? Why don't you heal them all? In Luke 16, when they brought the multitude, when they brought people to Jesus, the Bible says, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him, that's Jesus, and he healed them all. He didn't heal the ones who gave him checks or sent money. He healed them all, the Bible says. Can you give the again? Luke chapter 6, verse 19. And then there's another reference too, which I have not written down. Matthew's but Matthew what? Matthew's somewhere. Yeah, in Matthew, uh, it's clear that whoever went to Jesus, he healed them, whether they had faith or not, because he was God. Yeah. So with that introduction, we begin. Question, what was the question? In the passage in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, the question is, why does the King James use charity instead of love? The Greek, uh, the Greek word is agapi, which means love, but the King James translators believe that the, the word charity is, has a stronger meaning that is love in action. If you look up the English definition of the word charity, it means love in action. So it's not a wrong word. They just decided that the, that the word charity would mean, uh, would provide a stronger um, definition to what Paul is trying to say in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, if you use the word love, it's not wrong, because both charity and love uh, are, in the English language, could be interchangeable, because charity is love in action. That is a uh, biblical, uh, English dictionary definition of the word charity, but the Greek word is agapi, which is love. So hopefully that answers your question. Many layers of meaning to the word agape. Yeah, the Greek, the, the, in the Greek language is four uh, words to describe agapi. There's storhi. There's eros, there is agapi, and then there's philia. Uh, four different words for love, and they each have a different nuance. But 
by the time the New Testament was written, the Greek word agape and philia, agape and phileo, were interchangeable. At the time that the King James Bible was translated, the word charity does mean love, but it means love in action. But if your Bible says love, that is not an error. So hopefully that answers your question. So in James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, the, the James says, verse 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So that's what we're going to focus on this evening. James says, if you're afflicted, pray. And we mentioned last week's lesson, the three different types of affliction. Hopefully you remember them. Uh, first, you're afflicted because you sin. God chastens the saint who sins. Then you're afflicted because of persecution. If you're a Christian and you try to witness for Christ, you will be persecuted. And the third type of affliction is if you try to live a godly life, uh, people will make fun of you. You will be afflicted. James says, if you are happy, sing psalms. He says, if you are, um, uh, if you're happy, sing songs, and if you're afflicted, pray. Now, have you ever woken up in in the morning with a song in your heart, with a hymn in your heart? Yeah. That's the Holy Spirit, and He wants to cheer you up. Uh, there's a couple, many times I wake up in the morning, and there's this hymn that I haven't even, we haven't even sung in months. And who puts that there in your heart? The Holy Spirit does to cheer you up. And now here James gives us the accepted method in the New Testament for healing of God's people. James says if you're sick, call the elders of your church. And they have to anoint you with oil and pray over you. And God will heal you. Uh, now the oil used is olive oil. And it would come over you and they would pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And they'll pray over you. Now, does this guarantee healing? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But that's you should seek the elders of the church. Uh, oil is a type of the Holy Spirit in the in the uh, Old and New Testament, and oil in the Bible has use for medicinal purposes. In fact, they tell us you can make tea out of olive oil leaves, and there's a compound in olive oil leaves that's very very uh, medicinal. In Mark sixteen thirteen, uh, Jesus anointed many with oil, and he healed them. He healed the sick. Uh, in Luke chapter 10 verse 34 we see the story of the Samaritan when the uh, robbers when the robbers came and robbed him and injured him that the Samaritan bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him <coughs> the comment I want to make is that many times we castigate the charismatics for pushing uh, mirac miraculous healings but us Baptists, we do not avail ourselves of this formula for healing that we find in the New Testament. So the point that James is trying to make, instead of moping and complaining about your circumstance, why don't you pray to the Lord? The hymn writer says, uh, in, it, it tells us that we have to take it to the Lord. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Our precious Savior, He still is our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In all situations, uh, we need to pray to the Lord. Are you sorrow, sorrowful this morning? Pray to the Lord. Do you have a loved one that needs saved? Uh, pray to the Lord. Do you have a situation at work that's not working out? Pray to the Lord. You're happy? Pray to the Lord. God has blessed you with something? Thank Him in prayer. Uh, it's funny that God is, is a byword in many Christians' lives. When's the last time you got on your knees and you took some time and you prayed to God? And you poured your soul out to God? When's the last time you did that? If, if you can't think of a time, then perhaps you need to uh, sharpen your prayer life. Maybe work on your prayer life in the next coming days and weeks. Now, again, just because James gives us the formula for healing, it doesn't mean that you're automatically going to make it to be healed. It may seem that James is telling you that you do this and you will be healed 100% of the time, but we know from empirical evidence that, that doesn't work. Uh, I remember the elders came and prayed over my mother when she had cancer, 
and she didn't get healed. But the Charismatics came over. We had some friends who were Charismatics. We didn't agree with the doctrine, but they were friends of ours, and they came over, and they prayed over my mother, and they had convinced my dad that my mother was going to be healed from cancer. She died from her cancer. And I remember the day she passed was the day where my mother, my dad, was willing to let her go. Yeah. He wasn't willing to let her go. And I remember both me, my wife and I, we visited my mom at the hospital. It was a Tuesday. My dad was there, and, and uh, he told us that he was ready to let her go. And a few hours later, we got a call from my dad that said, Mom passed away. Isn't that amazing how sometimes that works? you got to let the person go. If they're ready for heaven, let them go. Question. Yes, there's a question. Elders are, is that the pastor or is that deacon? The elders in the New Testament uh, are formed by the pastors and deacons of the church. Those are the elders of the church. Now, for small that, churches... So other includes both groups? Yes, elders are pastors and deacons. Now, some people will have a different interpretation, and they say elders are a certain class of people, but uh, again, the Bible is clear. There's only two offices in the New Testament local church, that of a pastor and that of a deacon. Now, there's some uh, people that believe you can only have one pastor in a church. I, I don't believe that. I'm not a brethren. I believe there should be one senior pastor, but if the church is big enough, you have to bring on board other pastors to help with the ministering to the saints. So pastors and elders, sorry, pastors and deacons form the elders of the church. So now um, there's, they always use the excuse that if you don't get healed, you don't have enough faith. But, uh, but that is not, that is true and not true at the same time. I'll give you two examples in, from the New Testament where there's one man who had faith to be healed and, he was, and Paul healed him. Acts 14, 8 through 10. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent at his feet, being crippled from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Again, uh, you get healed not because you have faith, you get healed because it's the will of God. Now this man had faith to be healed, and it was the will of God to heal him, so therefore Paul healed him. But there's another example where there was a sick man in Mark chapter 2 that Jesus <coughs> healed a sick man because his friends had faith. Mm -hmm. Mark chapter 2 verse 4 through 5. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let, him, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, that is the friends of the sick man, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And then they all freaked out. Who can forgive sins but God only? And then Jesus said, To show you that I have the authority to forgive sins, he turned to the man who was sick and he says, Take up thy bed and walk. Now, I want to make it clear, we are not of those who believe we don't need doctors. I want to make it clear. Uh, you should seek a medical attention from a good doctor. Uh, I say that good doctor because if, you're not, if you have the wrong doctor, you're going to be a statistic. Remember the number three leading cause of death in the United States of America is medical errors. I, I, that's the truth. That's a fact. So if you end up being in the wrong, in the wrong doctor, you're going to die. And we have a doctor here that's laughing, and I'm not going to give you her name. But we know why she's laughing. Because she knows that this is truth, what I'm telling you. Uh, I'm not going to get her in more trouble. But in every field, you have good people and you've got bad people. That's in every single field. Uh, name it, you've got bad chefs and good chefs. We went to uh, North Carolina. We went to an Italian restaurant. Uh, one of my coworkers said it was good. We had the food there. And I couldn't believe what I was tasting. This can't be Italian food. It didn't taste like the Italian food that I'm used to. So, but anyways, I'm digressing. I need to get back to our lesson. So, <clears throat> when you get sick, you seek the elders of the church to pray for you. But at the same time, you need to seek for medical attention. And when I pray, I say, Lord, lead me to a good doctor. Lord, bless the doctor's hands. Give the doctor wisdom. Or if you're going for a procedure, Lord, be with the nurses and the staff and the, and the, uh, and the surgeons and whoever's going to work on me to do a good job, that they don't miss anything, that they don't forget anything when they sew me back up again. You know, you go through the uh, airport security and the, and the whole thing starts ringing. And they check you out and they say, you got metal in your body. And 
the doctor forgets the forceps in your in your abdominal cavity. But anyways, uh, it has happened. These things have happened. Uh, for example, uh, yeah. Whoops, what happened to my pliers? Hey, nurse, have you seen my pliers? Isn't that why they count everything after the surgery mm -hmm. too? Yeah, and they, they tell us here they count the all the instruments after the surgery. Why? Because things happen. Uh, doctors forget things. They're human beings, just like we are. Uh, Paul performed many miracles, but did you know that Paul needed a doctor? Paul prayed for healing, and God didn't heal him. Even though he had the power to heal other people, God didn't heal Paul. But God did the next best thing for him. You know what God <coughs> did for Paul? God found him a companion. Luke, the beloved physician, who accompanied him to the end of his journey. So God did not heal Paul, but he did the next best thing for Paul. He said, okay, Paul, I know you have a lot of aches and pains because they beat you and they stone you and they whip you. Uh, I'm not going to heal you, Paul, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a companion who happens to be a medical doctor. And the beloved physician, Luke, accompanied Paul in all his journeys. And Luke was blessed by, by being Paul's companion. In fact, Dr. Luke ended up writing the gospel according to Luke and the book of Acts. Uh, I love that story of Luke because uh, if you study the book of Acts, I'm going to digress here for a minute. I'm going to go, over, I know, big time over time. But i got to tell you what, the, uh, what happened in the New Testament. So Paul was going through the uh, Asia Minor. And every, he was going here, the Holy Spirit said, no, don't go there. And he was going there, and the Holy Spirit said, no, don't go there. And Paul said, Lord, you called me to preach, but why are you forbidding me from preaching in these cities? You know what God was doing to Paul? He was leading him to a city where he would end up meeting Luke. I love the way God leads our lives. And here in verse 15 of chapter 5, James says something odd. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So this is a, a uh, doctrinal conundrum, if you ask me. How could this be? How could the prayer of faith heal uh, a man who has sins, and his sins will be forgiven? Well, I have a, a uh, hypothesis here that I want to propose to you, and my hypothesis is scriptural. We know that the Bible teaches that if you live in sin as a Christian, uh, God will chasten you. God will come after you. God's going to ta tar your rear end, so to speak. Uh, it is possible that those Christians who get sick do so because of some unconfessed sin or sinful behavior in their lives. That is doctrinal. That is scriptural. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we have the case of a man who was having relations with his father's wife. Not necessarily his mother, but his father's wife. And Paul rebuked the church for allowing this to go on and doing nothing about it. In fact, 1 Corinthians 5, 3 through 6, listen to what Paul writes. He says, For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present, concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? So we know that Paul said, if this man continues in his sin, I'm going to pray that Satan come after him. <clears throat> and we know that Satan would have destroyed him. He could have done a lot of bad things to him. Uh, we have an example of Job. Now, Job was not attacked by the devil because he sinned, but because God allowed him. But what did the devil do to Job? Under the permission of God. He took everything he had. And, and then finally, what did the devil do to Job? He gave him a sickness. He made him sick. So it is possible that a New Testament believer who sins, continuing in sin, God's going to give him a sickness as a means of chastening for him sin. And when that man is sick, he calls the elders of the church. They pray over him. They anoint him. He gets healed. And he recognizes his, he's sick because of his sin. And he seeks God for forgiveness and restoration. And God will for, heal him and forgive him of his sin. You see how that works? Uh, and I think that's what James is alluding to here in verse 15. Now, I do want to bring on some, something else where some churches take this doctrine of anointing of the sick and they have perverted this commandment to anoint the sick. In fact, there's a church, the Roman Catholic Church, they have this sacrament called extreme unction. Many of you may be familiar with that. That is when the priest goes and he, he, uh, he what they call, he administers the last rites to a person who is on his deathbed. 
who is uh, seriously ill, and he prays, anoints that person, and prays for the recovery and salvation of that ill or injured person. You see how that's that's a distortion of what James here writes about. Uh, you cannot pray that someone gets saved. You cannot pray uh, for someone's salvation. You can pray that they get saved, but you cannot pray that God takes them, that God takes them to heaven. That's how they've distorted it. And no one can pray uh, for God to take you to heaven. <clears throat> you can pray that God saves you. I can pray for your salvation, but I cannot pray to God and say, Lord, take so-and-so to heaven after they've, di after they've died. That's not scripture. So they've twisted that. So something that the Holy Spirit intended for healing was made into a false preparation for death. Uh, many times you heard the last rites, they even, even pray over the dead. Somebody has passed away. They say, Lord, take this man's soul. You can't, that's too late. The decision of your soul is personal. No one can pray that God take your soul after you've passed away. And even while you're alive, uh, I can't pray and say, Lord, take this person to heaven. That doesn't work that way. I can pray, Lord, please save my neighbor. Lord, please save my dad. Lord, please save my mom. But what am I saying? Lord, please bring that person to a point in their life where they will personally make that choice to get saved. You see how that works? In fact, there's even uh, the Mormons. They, they get baptized for the dead. Yeah. Uh, thinking that if they get baptized for person X, Y, and Z, then God is going to take them to heaven after their death. It doesn't work that way. The Bible says today is a day of salvation. Once you die, you're, you, once you die you've already uh, settled your eternal destiny. If you do not know Christ as Savior, you're going to end up dying and going to hell. God gives you the opportunity till your very last dying breath for you to receive Christ as Savior. No one can pray that God take you to heaven. I can pray that God open your eyes and lead you to a place of salvation where you can uh, have all your demons. You know, sometimes, you know why people are blinded today? I'm, I'm, I'm running a lot of squirrels here at the same time. I'm trying to, I need to focus again. The devil blinds people. What the devil does is he does this to you. And you can't see the truth. There's a verse in the book of Acts that tells us to pray that, the, that these people be delivered from the blindness caused by Satan so that they can see the light. And I pray, when I pray for someone's salvation, I pray, Lord, deliver them from their demons, deliver them from their bondage that Satan has put upon them. Lord, please remove the scales from their eyes that they may see the truth. It's unfortunate uh, many people refuse to see the truth because they don't want to see the truth. Confession. I want to talk a little bit about confession. Again, this verse has been corrupted. And I'm going to get a little bit into the Bible versions again. Because in James <clears throat> chapter 5, verse 16, James says, Confess your faults one to another. Uh, this verse has been corrupted to promote false doctrine. The word false has been translated as sins in almost all modern translations. In fact, the Greek word paraptomata can be translated as fault, offense, sin, and trespass. And it's the context that will tell you which way to translate it. Uh, elsewhere, the word paraptoma in Greek is translated as fault in Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The translators uh, recognize that the correct rendering of the Greek word paraptoma was fault. But the issue is deeper than that. Remember when we started off and I was telling you about the two Greek texts? Well, the Nestle Allen Greek text, which comes from the West God Hort, in James 5.16, guess what word it has? It has the Greek word amartia, which means sin. Confess your sins one to another. This is the corrupt Greek text. The Textus Receptus, which is the Byzantine text, which is the same text the Greek Orthodox Church considers to be authentic, has the word paraptoma. This text has word, the word paraptoma, which is translated as fault, and this word has the word amartia, which is translated as sins. Do you see how having the right Bible is so important? Because if you have the wrong Bible, your Bible will say, 
confess your sins one to another. Check it out. If you think I'm lying to you, open up your modern English Bible and see what James 5.16 says. And the Roman Catholic Church uses this verse that we are supposed to confess our sins to the priests. If you look it up, I'm not lying to you. The sacrament of confession uh, is to be done by, to the priest. Where do they get that from? James 5.16. It says, hey, the Bible tells us to confess our sins to one another, and therefore the laity confess their sins to the priests. And this is, this is a heresy. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 tells us, For there is one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. And uh, the priest does not have authority to forgive sins. I'm sorry to tell you that. Uh, and that's the same goes with the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, any church that tells you that their priest has the authority to, any church for that matter, I'm not just picking on the Roman Catholics and the Greek Orthodox, any denomination that tells you their minister or their pastor or their priest has the authority to forgive you of your sins is wrong. Mm -hmm. In fact, <clears throat> I'm going to read to you uh, what the Pharisees and the Sadducees said against Christ in Mark 2.7. Why doth this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And Luke 5, 21, And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So they were accusing Christ of saying blasphemy because Christ was forgiving people's sins. Now, when Christ was for forgiving people's sins, what, what was he basically telling the Jewish crowd? I'm God. I'm God. That's what he was telling the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. He's telling them to show you that I have the authority to forgive sins because I'm God. I'm going to heal these people. And he did. Now, the Catholics say is that the priests stand in the place of Christ and that Christ has given them the authority to forgive sins. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not getting too much detail where they get that from, but that is wrong. That is not right from the scripture. The Bible is clear. Confession is only made to God. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us up from all sin. And 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, to who? To God. <coughs> he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. That the authority to forgive sin belongs only to God. And if someone stands in the place of God, they are robbing God of his authority. And if you are trusting in your priest to forgive your sins, guess what? Your sins have not been forgiven. You are still going to hold on to them and you will end up paying for them in hell. Right. There's only one person who can take away your sins. There's only one person who can say, thy sins are forgiven. Yeah. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see how important it is to have the right Bible? The King James Version is the only English Bible that is doctrinally inerrant. And this may offend you, I'm sorry. I cannot stress this enough. But you have been warned. You can use any Bible you want. But you are now been, been warned and you are without excuse. But you say, I don't like the these and the thous. But you studied Shakespeare in English class in high school. And you were okay with that. I remember we would did Macbeth and, and other stuff uh, in, in English high school. You okay with that? Now I have... Um, I have a comment in Heaven Exists. It's called Gan Eden, but Hell does not really exist in the Jewish faith. Oh, Hell does that. exist in the Jewish faith. Uh, Sheol in the Hebrew language could stand for three different things. Death, Hell, and the grave. Uh, and... and uh, we can get into that. I can have, if you'd like, I can have a lesson. In fact, you know what I'll do? Once we get to those little booklets, we're going to do a study on hell. And I will show you from the Old Testament uh, where hell is found in the Old Testament. The word Sheol in Hebrew uh, stands for three different things. Uh, Hebrew is a lot like the, like the Greek language. Sometimes a word can have different meanings. So uh, we'll get into that. But here in my notes, I have a list of 44 omitted verses, and I'm not going to get into them. I'm just going to flash that here. And if you want to take a screenshot and look at them, of 44 omitted verses, and I give you some verses that I have been tampered with in the New Testament. So take, go ahead and take a screenshot. I'm going to hold it here for a few more seconds. Uh, and pause and look at these verses. Take the King James Bible and take your Bible or... 
uh, or another Bible and do a comparison and see if what I'm telling you is the truth. Now, your Bible may or may not have all these verses tampered with, but guaranteed many of them will be changed and tampered with. Now, remember again, I told you with the apostasy of the church, how it begins. It begins with a corruption of the scriptures. It begins with a corruption of church music. It begins with the corruption of dress standards and the corruption of ecclesiastical polity and finally acceptance of ecumenism. And that's where right now you're going to see, let's all go along to get along. The Bible calls for a separation. That doesn't mean I hate people. It means I stick to my standards and I will not change my standards no matter what. Now, why do we confess our faults one to another? Now, we do that <clears throat> for accountability. If I have some weakness or if there's a sin that I struggle with, I tell my brother and sister in Christ not to receive their forgiveness, but to receive their help. Uh, I call them, hey, uh, I'm struggling with this. Can you pray for me? Uh, for example, uh, accountability. For, you can tell your, your friend, hey, how was your week? Were you faithful in your Bible reading? Were you faithful in your prayer? Uh, did you avoid the bar this week? Did you avoid the strip club this week? I didn't see you in church this week. Is everything okay? Uh, that's what confessing your faults is. It's not confessing your sins. It's confessing your faults so that there be some accountability. One commentator said, Faults are habitual tendencies to err in making value judgments, to err in responding to certain people or situations, to misjudge the same thing more than once, to complain or get upset about things you knew or little things and failing to be careful while doing work or taking with people or impressing people. Um, example of some faults can be laziness, appetite, clumsiness, lack of consideration for others, uh, judging too hastily. Uh, you, you have a different taste in clothes or colors which are odd and weird. Uh, being indifferent, overlooking details, these are faults. So you can become so you can become accountable uh, to each other. That's why we have to confess our faults to one another. Now, as we come to the end of our lesson, we're gonna. I want to take a a few minutes. We got a few minutes. We're gonna be just a little bit over, but I want to talk about prayer. And in James chapter five verse sixteen b, we have one of the most important verses on prayer. James sixteen five sixteen says, "The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man." availeth much. James here gives us three keys to prayer. Prayer first must be effectual, then it must be fervent, then it must come from the lips of a righteous man. Prayer must be on purpose, it must be passionate, and it must come from a pure heart. A prayer must have a petition in mind, done with a pouring of your soul, and come from a pious person. So I want to look at the effectual, first three words, effectual, fervent, and righteousness and we will be done with this lesson this evening so when you pray do you have a purpose in mind or you just pray willy-nilly uh, there must be a distinct answer you're looking for from God uh, Charles Finney said effectual prayer must have a definite object in other words we must be specific in our request otherwise how will we know if our prayer has been answered for example if I pray Lord save the world that's not gonna happen because I'm not praying with understanding. Now, if I say, Lord, save my child, or Lord, save my neighbor, or Lord, save my coworker, and I give the Lord their name, and I continually pray for that person, then I'll know if God has answered my prayer. And God will always answer you according to his will. So the Bible says, God is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. So when I pray for the salvation of a, perfect, for of a specific person, I'm praying according to God's will. Now, whether they get saved or not, it's going to be up to them. But uh, someone said, if you are praying for someone, if many people are praying for someone, that person has to jump over a lot of prayers for them to end up in hell. Yeah. A lot of prayers, a lot of prayers. Never give up on your loved ones. I've heard stories of people's loved ones getting saved after they even passed away, decades later. In fact, it was a... It was a Can you clarify that? What did I say? Of people, uh, people whose loved ones got saved after they died. Not after the loved one. Not after the loved one died. The after the person who was praying for the loved yes. one died. So, for example, I've been praying for a person X, and I die, and years later, that person I prayed for so long ended up getting saved. Yeah. In fact, there was a uh, there was a man. I think he wanted his brother-in-law or to get saved. He says, "Lord, do whatever it takes." 
to save my brother-in-law. And you know what happened? His little girl got into a car accident and she ended up dying. And his brother-in-law got saved during the funeral. When the pastor gave a message of salvation, that man saw his brother-in-law get saved during the funeral of his own daughter. So be careful sometimes. He was praying, Lord, do whatever it takes to save my brother-in-law. And God will only give you good things. Matthew 7, 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? All the answers to your prayers must be good for you. Sometimes you don't get answers to your prayers or God will not give you what you ask for because it's not good for you. Many Christians pray for a million dollars and they will never get it because God knows if they get it, their hearts will stray from him. Christians think that money is the answer to all things. Oh, if I had money, I'd give to God. You don't even give to God now. And you think God's going to give you a million dollars so you can give to him after or later? Think about that. Much of our prayer is ineffective because it's not fervent. What is fervency? Fervency is when you pray with passion, when you pray with emotion, when you pray with tears. In his book, The Essentials of Prayer, Ian e. Bounds writes, Prayer must be aflame. Its ardor must consume. Prayer without fervor is as a sun without light or heat, as a flower without beauty or fragrance. A soul devoted to God is a fervent soul. The prayer is a creature of that flame. He can only truly pray who is all aglow for holiness, for God and for heaven. You know, Ian e. Bounds wrote a series of prayer, entire book series of prayer, and he prayed before he wrote down every single sentence. If effective prayer must be fervent, not because we want to persuade a reluctant God, but that we want to move God's heart when he sees our heart moved for the thing that we are praying for. Do you not think if you're praying, crying over the soul of your loved one and tears are pouring down your face, do you think that's not going to affect God's heart? Of course it will. Of course it will. Charles Finney said, if the desire for an object is strong and is a benevolent desire and the thing is not contrary to God's will, the presumption is that it will be granted. If you find yourself exercised with a benevolent desire, there is a strong presumption that God's Spirit is exciting these desires. When's the last time you wept before God when you prayed, when tears ran down your cheeks, praying for someone that you love? Tears are a language that God understands. He sees the tears of a broken heart and he hears every single one of them as soon as they fall and drop to the ground. David said in Psalm 6, 6, I am weary with my groaning all night. I make uh, all the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears. And then he writes in Psalms 126.5, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Is, it, is, it, is our lack of answer to prayer due to our lack of fervency in praying? And then God expects you to pray out of a righteous heart. Now, we are not talking about righteousness, seeking our own righteousness, because our righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. But we are talking about a righteousness that comes from a person who is saved, who has trusted Christ as Savior, and is seeking to live a life that is pleasing to God. Uh, the saint who puts on Christ, the saint who dies daily, the, saints who, the saint who strives to live a holy life, he does so not to be accepted by God because he knows he's already accepted by the Beloved, but he does so to be found doing the will of God. God is looking for the saint who walks in the newness of life. I recognize that Christ died for me and I have his righteousness, but at the same time, now that I've been made a new creature in Christ, I walk as holy as I can. Not for salvation, but I want to maintain that relationship with God. When we pray in this manner, that's when things happen. A prayer unlocks the hand that can give all things. Prayer moves the hand that moves the universe. And I want to end up by giving you a few quotes on prayer. The Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots, known as Bloody Mary, is reputed to have said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. Edwin Harvey said, A day without prayer is a day without blessing, and a life without prayer is a life without power. Billy Sunday said, If you are a stranger to prayer, you are a stranger to the greatest source of power known to human beings. Oswald Chambers said, Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. And finally, Francis Fenelon said, Time spent in prayer is never wasted. 
So we come to the end of our lesson this evening. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please do so. I, uh, I take your questions to heart. And uh, the question about uh, hell is not in the Old Testament, we will cover that in a few weeks once we get to the uh, essential doctrines of the Christian faith. There's a lot of Old Testament prophecies that were answered in the New Testament. And the Greek word uh, adi, which is hell, is referencing to the Hebrew word sheol. So there's a connection there between the Old Testament and the New Testament that sheds us light. So thank you for joining us. We have one more lesson in the book of James, and hopefully we'll finish next week.